Hello and welcome to the second lesson in Call of the Wild. This is the role of sled dogs inspiring the Iditarod. For this lesson, you will read information about sled dogs and learn background knowledge for the story Call of the Wild, which we will start next week. And you will answer questions using evidence from the text about sled dogs. All right, so what makes a good sled dog? Uh, so they have to be strong and they have to have a really good sense of athleticism. They have to be an athlete. These dogs are top-notch athletes, just like, you know, any long-distance runner or person who spends a long time running. These dogs have to be conditioned um, to be good athletes. Um, they have to be suited to work in cold climates. So, you know, hunting dogs, Labradors, things like that they're not going to be suited for cold climates. Um, however, huskies, malamutes, and things like that, um, they have thick coats of fur. They have tough feet for running on packed snow and ice. Um, so those are the perfect dogs. We're going to watch a video about that in uh, just a minute here. Uh, they have to work hard with a pack, but still be independent. So they have to follow the rules, but they still also have to be willing to, um, to be strong and independent-minded. Um, they have to want to please their trainer or their owner because in the end, that person who is running that sled is the one who is in charge. Um, there are three breeds that are most commonly used, so Siberian Huskies, Alaskan Malamutes, and Alaskan Huskies. Um, these guys here, uh, most of them look like Siberian Huskies, although this guy back here could be a Malamute or an Alaskan Husky. They're usually pretty big, um, beefy dogs. Um, so we're going to watch a video really quickly about what it takes to be a sled dog. So you have this video. Um, we're just going to watch for a few minutes. It's about two minutes and 38 seconds long. Time it takes a minute. minute. Humans, Humans are, are not the fastest mammals, mammals on the planet, planet. But, but over really, really long, long distances, distances, we can outrun every, every other species, other species on, land, on land, except certain, certain dogs. dogs. The greatest, the greatest ultra marathoners, marathoners on the planet, planet are first and now mixed with red for sled racing. racing. While well, pulling alone, they run five back-to-back -back -back marathons in a day, day after day, day, for more than a week. week. That's because of the totally unique way they turn food into energy. Like all mammals, sled dogs rely on two types of fuel. There is glycogen, which comes from carbs and sugar, and is quick to ignite and fast burning, like natural gas. And they're stuffed in protein, which come from, well, fat and protein, which are not that flammable and burn slowly, kind of like moths. Glycogen can power a runner on its own for a period of short, intense exercise, but because it burns up fast, long-distance runners rely mostly on a supply of slow-burning fats and proteins. In order to turn fats and proteins into energy, though, most males need to also keep burning a small but steady supply of glycogen, and that turns out to be a serious problem because the body's glycogen storage tanks are pretty small, and converting carbs and sugars into glycogen takes a little while. So, so runners, runners burn, burn glycogen, glycogen faster, faster than they can, than they make, can make it. If they if run for long enough, their supply will inevitably run out, and they'll bomb. Sled dogs never bomb, because early in the race, their bodies somehow shift over to burning fat and protein without needing to use any glycogen at all. And since fat and protein can be turned into energy pretty much immediately, the dogs can refuel throughout the race without ever worrying about running out of glycogen. We still don't know how this fuel burning trick works, but we do know that after nine days and a thousand miles through the snow and ice, most dogs finish the race with the same baseline vitals that they started with. In fact, unlike human ultra athletes who often need months to recover, the dog teams that do best in one ultra race are often the ones that have just recently returned from another one. When it comes to feats of endurance, blood dogs turn the competition to much. So after watching that video, now you understand what makes a sled dog good for long um, bouts of running and pulling sleds for long periods of time. So before sled dogs, in the gold rush, people had to carry all their supplies on their backs while prospecting for gold. Um, that's a lot of supplies. Um, so dogs not only pulled gold rush sleds, um, but often pulled mail sleds and um, pulled other supplies. A single dog could pull 200 pounds and a team of six could carry a year's worth of supplies. All right, so that's going to be thousands of pounds worth of supplies that people are going to need to last in the gold rush. Um, and as you saw in some of those pictures that you looked at in the um, Exploring the Gold Rush Sway that you guys did in the last class, you can see, you know, the terrain was difficult and 
you were not able to go back out to run to the store if you, you know, forgot a supply. Um, not like we can do now. All right. Um, so one of the things that inspired the Iditarod, which is the national um, dog sled race, uh, that is, is held every year. Actually, they just had it not too long ago. Um, so one of the things that inspired that, or the thing that inspired that, is uh, the 1925 diphtheria run. Um, so in 1925 in Nome, Alaska, a diphtheria epidemic broke out and made most of the town deathly ill. Uh, the nearest serum to cure the disease was over 647 miles away. So the dog sled teams led by Togo and Balto made that journey in order to fetch the life-saving serum. So you may have seen the movie Balto. Uh, it's cartoon, came out several, several years ago, but you may have grown up watching it or seen it, you know, in another class. So this down here is the dog Balto. Although Togo, we will find in our assignment for today, is actually the dog who made more of the run. They are both owned by um, the same gentleman. His uh, last name is Cephala. Um, but you'll learn a little bit more about that in your... Um, your assignment for today and your remote assignment tomorrow. Um, so the dog sleds in the media, some of the things that you may have um, seen or might be interested in um, are some of these films or books below. So Togo uh, was made last year, um, actually came out while I was teaching this unit last year. It is only found on Disney Plus, so if you have Disney Plus, you can watch it. Also found on Disney Plus are Eight Below and Iron Will. Um, Eight Below can also be found on Amazon, uh, and the, unfortunately the other ones are harder to find. Um, Iron Will is an excellent movie. You possibly can find it on YouTube. I would check there if you're interested in, um, looking at any of these other films. Um, some of the stories, some of the books, uh, that have been out for a while about dog sledding are Stone Fox by John Reynolds Gardner, Winter Dance, and Woodsong, both by Gary Paulson. Um, so those might be things if you are interested in the idea of dog sledding or dog sled stories or the adventure of it, you might be interested in watching those. There is also a film of Stone Fox that's very old, probably from the 80s, um, that you also might be able to find that on YouTube as well. All right, so for your assignment today, now that you've gone through this PowerPoint, you will need to read the dog sled article and answer the questions that accompany that article. Um, so please answer in complete sentences using details and quotes from the text. Don't forget to explain your answers. Don't just copy and paste quotes. Use the race format, please. So on your assignment, there is a link for this article, but the article is also located in the document with the questions that you can edit, and that is what I am in right now. So I recommend just opening that. That way you can open it and answer questions as you go. If you scroll to the bottom, you will see the questions that you have. So let's review our questions before we do the reading. So number one, Alaskan winters are typically cold and harsh, but in January of 1925, the weather was more severe than normal. What are some of the harsh conditions faced during this time? Find three examples from the text that illustrate these conditions. Please be sure to explain why they are harsh. This might be a little bit longer of an answer. That's okay. Number two, on the night of January 27th, 1925, a train whistle pierced uh, Nanana's stillness as it arrived with the precious cargo. So there are some sensory, or examples of sensory images in this article, like the example above. So the train whistle piercing the stillness, that is a sound imagery. Remember, imagery plays on the five senses. So you are now going to need to look for three more examples of sensory images all right, and tell me what sense it goes to. So you have sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. All right, so you're going to go through your reading and see which ones you can find. Try to find ones other than sight, please. And if you find one that's sight, find one that is very vivid. Uh, number three, find two examples of figurative language in the article. Identify the type of figurative language used and explain the literal meaning of the example. So the example that they give, it says, in the teeth of a gale, a gale is a gust of wind, that dropped wind chills to 85 below zero. This is an example of personification, where the wind is so cold it felt like it was biting your skin. So wind doesn't have teeth, all right? 
So remember, you have similes, you have metaphors, you have personification, you have hyperbole, which is that over-exaggeration. You have all different kinds of types of figurative language that you can go through. And what I would do is keep listening to this video as I'm reading. I might give you a hint as to where you might find it. Number four, if his dogs ran too fast and breathed too deeply in such frigid conditions, they could frost their lungs and die of exposure. Four dogs died from exposure, giving their lives so that others could live. In this case, what does the word exposure mean in the previous sentences? You do not need a dictionary. Give it your best guess. Number five, how did Leonard Sapala feel about Balto getting all the glory? Use the details from the text to support your answer, and there should also be a race format answer, please. All right, now that we have read the questions first, now we can look at this article from history.com, the sled dog relay that inspired the Iditarod. The children of Nome were dying in January 1925. Infected with diphtheria, they wheezed and gasped for air and every day brought a new case of the lethal respiratory disease. So this should kind of hit close to home right now since we are dealing with a pandemic of COVID. All right, so diphtheria was very much like COVID. Um, it affects the lungs and back then they didn't have med medicine readily available to them. Okay, that would help with things like fevers or to get rid of the, the illness and whatnot. Nome's lone physician, Dr. Curtis Welsh, feared an epidemic that could put the entire village of 1400 at risk. He ordered a quarantine, but knew that only an antiox uh, antitoxin serum could ward off the fast spreading disease. So once again, He's ordering quarantine. He needs some sort of thing that will ward off the disease. It's very much like us dealing with um, quarantine and trying to get the vaccine so that we can you know, not catch uh, COVID. The nearest batch of the life-saving medicine, however, rested more than a thousand miles away in Anchorage. Nome's ice-choked harbor made sea transport impossible and op open cockpit airplanes could not fly to Alaska's sub-zero temperatures. With the nearest train station nearly 700 miles away in Nanana, canine power offered Nome its best hope for a speedy delivery. Sled dogs regularly beat Alaska's snowy trails to deliver mail and the territory's governor, Scott C. Bone, recruited the best drivers and dog teams to stage a round-the-clock relay to transport the serum from Nanana to Nome. On the night of January 27, 1925, a train whistle pierced Nanana's stillness as it arrived with the precious cargo, a 20-pound package of serum wrapped in a protective fur. Musher Wild Bill Shannon tied the parcel to his sled. As he gave the signal, the paws of Shannon's nine Malamutes pounded the snow trail on the first steps of a 674-mile uh, great race of mercy through rugged wilderness across frozen waterways and over treeless tundra. Even by Alaska's standards, this winter night packed extra bite, with temperatures plummeting to 60 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Although every second was precious as the number of confirmed cases in Nome mounted, Shannon knew he needed to control his speed. If his dogs ran too fast and breathed too deeply in such frigid conditions, they could frost their lungs and die of exposure. Although Shannon ran next to the sled to raise his own body temperature, he still developed hypothermia and frostbite on the 500, uh, on the 52 mile leg to Tolavana before handing off the serum to the second dog team. I will tell you that you could probably get a piece of figurative language out of this first sentence. It's a little bit of a stretch, but you could do it. With moonlight and even the northern lights illuminating the dark Alaskan winter days, the relay raced an at an average speed of six miles per hour, while each leg averaged 30 miles. The country's most famous musher, Norwegian-born Leonard Sapala, departed Shaktulik on January 31st on an epic 91-mile leg. 
having already rushed 170 miles from Nome to intercept the relay. Sapala decided on a risky shortcut over the frozen North Sound in the teeth of a gale that dropped wind chills to 85 degrees below zero. Sapala's lead dog, 12-year-old Siberian Husky Togo, had logged tens of thousands of miles, but none as important as these. Togo and his 19 fellow dogs struggled for their traction on Norton Sound, Glassy Sink, and the fierce winds threatened to break apart the ice and send the team adrift to sea. The team made it safely to the coastline only hours before the ice cracked. Gusts continued to batter the team as it hugged the coastline before meeting the next musher, Charlie Olson, who after 25 miles handed off the serum to Gunnar Kaysen for the scheduled second to last leg of the relay. So if you watch the movie of Togo, this scene where he's running across um, the frozen water is much more dramatic because it's breaking and he's jumping from iceberg to iceberg. So just know that in that film, that is not actually how this scene went down. As Kaysen set off into a blizzard, the pelting snow grew so fierce that his squinting eyes could not see any of his team, let alone his trusted lead dog, Balto. On loan from Sepala's kennel, Balto relied on scent rather than sight to lead the 13-dog team over the beaten trail as ice began to crust the long hairs of his brown coat. Suddenly, a massive gust of upwards of 80 miles per hour flipped the sled and launched the antidote into a snowbank. Panic coursed through Kaysen's frostbitten body as he tore off his mitts and rummaged through the snow with his numb hands before locating the serum. Kaysen arrived in port safety in the early morning hours of February 2nd, but when the next team was not ready to leave, the driver decided to forge on to Nome himself. After covering 53 miles, Balto was the first sign of Nome's salvation. As the sled dogs yipped and yapped down Front Street at 5.30 a.m., to deliver the valuable packages to Dr. Welsh. Yipped and yapped is absolutely a type of figurative language. What type of figurative language is basically having when words are spelled the way they sound? I'm gonna let you figure that one out for yourself. The relay had taken five and a half days, cutting the previous speed record nearly in half. Four dogs died from exposure, giving their lives so that others could live. Three weeks after injecting the residents of Nome, Dr. Crosby lifted the quarantine. Although more than 150 dogs and 20 drivers participated in the relay, it was the canine that led the final miles that became a media superstar. Within weeks, Balto was inked to a Hollywood contract to star in 30-minute film, Balto's Race to Nome. After a nine-month vaudeville tour, Balto was present in December 1925 as a bronze statue of his likeness was unveiled in New York Central Park. That um, statue, I believe, is still there in Central Park to this day. Sepala and his Siberians also toured the country and even appeared in an advertising campaign for Lucky Strike cigarettes, but the famous driver resented the glory lavished on Balto at the expense of Togo, who had guided the relay's longest and most arduous stretch. It was almost more than I could bear when the newspaper dog, Balto, received a statue for his glorious achievements, Seppala remarked. The serum run was Togo's last long-distance feat. He died in 1929, and his preserved body is on view at the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race headquarters in Wasilla, Alaska. After the limelight faded, Balto lived out his final days at the Cleveland Zoo, and his body is on display at the Cleveland National History Museum. Since 1973, the memory of the serum run has lived on in the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race, which is held each March and is run on some of the same trails beat, beaten by Balto, Togo, and dozens of other sled dogs in a furious race against the time nearly 90 years ago. So I'm going to tell you this last sentence has an example also of um, figurative language. Um, so basically you get all the information that you need um, to answer all of your questions. 
And now that we've finished uh, the reading, you can absolutely go on and finish your questions. Please make sure to answer them as completely as possible to get full points. All right, have a great day.